gives me great pleasure to welcome our colloquium speaker, uh, Pablo Jirio Herrero. Uh, he is currently the Cecil and Ida Green Professor of Physics at MIT. Um, he got his undergraduate training at the University of Valencia in Spain and uh, spent a couple of years at UC San Diego before going to Delft, where he got his doctorate in 2005. And then he, via Columbia, uh, ended up at MIT as an assistant professor in uh, 2008. And uh, Pablo is extremely you know, well-regarded and well-known. His group has done pioneering work on 2D materials. And, and particularly, uh, there's been a lot of uh, fame and attention lately because of the discovery of superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphene, um, for, 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 for which, among other things, Pablo was uh, co-awarded the, um, the Oliver E. Buckley Prize by the American Physical Society this year. Um, he's won a whole, you know, the whole host of awards, NSF Career, Sloan, Packard, um, all the good ones. Uh, and, uh, and it's, you know, fantastic that he's able to be here. Um, I, when I invited him a year ago, the thought was, well, surely by a year from now, we'll be able to have an in-person visit. But obviously, uh, COVID intervened. But anyway, Pablo, you know, we're, we're delighted to have you here, and we're looking forward to, to hearing your talk. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Doug, and thank you very much for the invitation. And I just wish I could be uh, over there enjoying the nice, um, you know, weather from Houston that we were just discussing about. So um, thank you again, everyone, for for being here. And I want to tell you about, you know, the title of my talk is More Magic 3.0. This is a pretty recent development. I mean, the, the whole field of of more quantum matter and you know, twistronics is, is pretty young, but you know, this latest development of moving towards new types of you know, next generation more quantum matter is going to, you know, I think it's quite exciting and I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, able to tell you about. But now, because it's a colloquium, I wanna start from a bit more of a you know, general uh, point of view to talk about interactions in systems. So it turns out that among the most fascinating states of matter that we have in the universe are those where, the interactions between the individual constituents that make up that matter are very strong. Yeah? So this is something that happens, for example, in the quark gluon plasma state, which is a state of matter that happens a few hundreds of nanoseconds, microsecond after the big one, and that we can recreate nowadays in heavy ion collisions, such as those at Blue Haven National Laboratory. The different phases of nuclear matter in neutral stars are also strongly correlated. If you go to Wikipedia, you can see that these phases, they're called nuclear pasta. You know, they, they have very funny names like the Bucatini phase, the lasagna phase, the spaghetti phase, you know. And, and you know, as usual, the astrophysicists are very creative with naming things. And perhaps, you know, closer to you know, my heart, you know, the different phases of topological states of matter are, you know, uh, the different these different phases are often, you know, very strongly correlated phases. For example, if you take a two-dimensional electron gas and you subject it to a perpendicular magnetic field, you can enter the fractional quantum hole regime, where strong interactions between your electrons lead to quasi-particles that have fractionalized charge and very interesting topological properties. Now, zooming in a bit more into the field of quantum materials, you know, these are, you know, strongly correlated quantum materials. There are large classes, families quantum materials, which, which where the interactions between electrons are very strong. And perhaps the most famous one or the most you know, studied one is the family of high temperature cupric superconductors, where in a phase diagram of temperature versus doping, you get these, you know, very, you know, a variety of phases, few of which we have a good understanding of even to this day, okay? So, the problem, you know, with strongly interactive systems is that, or you know, one of the problems is that they're very hard to solve theoretically, okay? And this gets exemplified, for example, in the high temperature Cooper superconductor. So there the action takes place in this copper oxygen plane, okay? Where in the parent compound, okay, you have one electron per unit cell, one electron per copper atom, as exemplified here. And these electrons interact very strongly so they're stuck in their atoms. They cannot jump from atom to atom because they repel each other very strongly. Now, an interesting game takes place if you now remove a few of these electrons, okay? We say that we dope with holes the system. Then you go from a correlated, you know, it's called a mod insulator state to a superconductor as the electrons now start to move but start to do so in a correlated fashion, okay? As 
you know, electrons jump from side to side and, you know, as some sites become empty. Now, the physics of this system is believed to be described by the Hubbard model. It's a model, you know, that includes that strong Coulomb repulsion U when you occupy one side with two electrons and allows for tunneling between adjacent sites when, you know, a site is empty. Now, when I say we believe that the basic, system, you know, the basic physics in, in you know, the Cooper supercomputer is described by this model because we actually do not know how to theoretically solve this problem analytically, okay? And as a result, we believe this contains the essential physics to describe you know, this phase diagram, but we're not sure. There's a question mark here, how to get from this model to you know, each of these phases, okay? Now, this difficulty in uh, trying, you know, in solving theoretically, you know, even simple model driving Hubbard model has led to alternative approaches to try to investigate strongly correlated materials. And one of them, you know, so we have these two platforms, you know, we can look at the quantum materials themselves, okay, with typically atomic scale lattices, lattice scales. You can also do cold atoms in, uh, in optical, ultra cold atoms in optical lattices, where now you shine you know, two sets of lasers and you create this periodic potential where you can put your atoms and you can control the interaction strength in these atoms, okay? These cold atoms optical lattices, the typical length scale, the separation between these you know, atoms here in the lattice is about a micro. So we have had traditionally these two platforms, this one for many, many decades, this one for about 20 years, two decades that we have had this. And what I'm gonna tell you about today is that there is a new platform called More Quantum Matter, Okay. with a typical length scale, the Moray length scale or Moray wavelength of the order of 10 nanometers, which is nicely about two orders of magnitude from either of these two platforms, okay? Now, associated with these length scales are energy scales or temperature scales. In actual quantum materials, we have, you know, typical energy scales of the order of 100 or 1,000 Kelvin. In ultra-cold atoms lattices, we have about 0.1 to 1 nano Kelvin. And in water quantum matter, this is sort of intermediate, you know, one to 10, one to 100 Kelvin, precisely because this length scale is intermediate between these two other length scales. So the thing that has possibilitated the development of this new platform is the fact that we can do this thing, which sometimes is called twistronics, you know, which is that we can place two two-dimensional crystalline lattices on top of each other with an arbitrary angle of rotation. Right? This is something that has no history, you know, no, there's no precedent in the history of material science for being able to do this thing. It's just now that we have these two dimensional crystalline lattices, the past the decade and a half, that we can do that. We can play them at any angle of rotation between them. Okay, this is a non equilibrium state of matter that it's possible because these lattices are two dimensional. And as I'm going to show you, the electronic, you know, the optical, the mechanical, and invertebral the electronic properties of these rotated, you know structures can vary dramatically from those of the individual constituents. So with this, let me tell you, you know, with this introduction, let me tell you uh, the outline of my talk. So I'm going to first uh, describe, you know, graphene and magic angle graphene and more quantum matter. I will tell you uh, about some of the developments that occurred after our discovery in 2018. Then I will introduce you the next generation Moray quantum matter. I call this Moray Magic 3.0. In particular, the system Magic Angle Trilayer Graphene or Magic Angle Twisted Trilayer Graphene. Okay? It's a very highly tunable system which realizes ultra strong coupling superconductivity. And I'll tell you something that we have very recently measured this unexpected surprise, which is that you know, the system is very likely a spin triplet superconductor. And then I will end with some of the outlook of other things that are going on. So let's start with graphene. Okay, I'm sure you have had plenty of talks about graphene. So let me just very simply describe it. Graphene is a honeycomb of carbon atoms. All of, the, all of these atoms are from the chemical point of view equivalent, they're all carbon. But from the crystallographic point of view, they are inequivalent. Okay, it turns out you need a two atom basis and two unit vectors in two dimensions to tile a honeycomb. So we call these the A and B atoms or the red and green balls in this diagram. Now, in a simple quantum mechanical model, you can calculate the electronic structure for electrons in graphene, so energy versus momentum in the x and y direction. And it has this very peculiar and famous electronic structure because near the Fermi energy, near charge neutrality, you have this linear energy momentum dispersion, which looks more characteristic of systems like photons rather than you know, electrons in a solid. 
where you typically have quadratic energy momentum dispersion. Now, this linear dispersion can be actually formalized in a Hamiltonian form, okay? This is nothing else, you know, this is linear energy, linear in K, and this is nothing else but the Dirac equation in two dimension for massless particles, okay? Now, in the usual Dirac equation, you have this, you know, this spinner tells you whether the spin of the electron is up or down. In graphene, this is a pseudo spinner, which tells you whether the weight of the electron wave function is on the A type of atoms or on the B type of atoms. Okay? Now, the only other thing I want you to know about graphene, I need you to know about graphene, is that there are two of these double Dirac cones, you know, they're called the K and K prime valleys. Okay, so we said that electrons in graphene have fourfold degeneracy. They have a spin up, spin down, valley K, valley K prime, or four degrees of freedom, we say too. Okay, now what happens if you put graphene on top of graphene and you twist it? Okay, then a more pattern forms, okay, where the more wavelength, which is the distance between the soccer balls that you see on the screen, okay. It's roughly inversely proportional to the twist angle. So in particular, this can go all the way to infinity because these are identical lattices, okay? Now, what happens to that electronic structure that I've just mentioned in the previous slide when you put these two graphene sheets and you rotate them, okay? Well, I'm gonna take the case where this, this angle of rotation between the two sheets is small, okay? For small angle, you have the direct cones of, you know, graphene layer number one and the Dirac cone of graphene layer number two, they're close to each other, okay? If the reciprocal spaces rotate also by the same angle as the real space, and if the angle is small, these Dirac cones are just separated by a distance in momentum space proportional to the twist angle. Now, this would be the situation that would occur, this would be the electronic structure of this twisted by layer graphene system, if the electrons in one graphene sheet did not know that the other graphene sheet exists. However, because these two graphene sheets, when we put them on top of each other, are only three angstroms apart, the electrons can actually tunnel between the two sheets. Okay? So they are very much aware that the other graphene sheet exists. And this leads to bonding and anti-bonding states in the electronic structure at that crossing point. Okay? So due to this interlayer tunneling, you have that one band gets pushed down in energy, another one gets pushed up in energy, okay? This is similar to bonding and anti-bonding states in a hydrogen molecule, but in this case, we have two graphene sheets, so this is a giant graphene molecule, okay? Now, this is the situation when the interlayer tunneling is small compared to the energy of that crossing point. But as we decrease the twist angle, these two direct points get closer and closer to each other, and this band, the bonding state, gets pushed down to lower and lower energy until it reaches zero. Okay? And it reaches zero, when, when, when it reaches zero, we say that the flat band condition has been realized. And that happens at the magic angle, okay? When the twist angle is 1.1 degree, that's the value of the magic angle that was theoretically predicted for graphene, okay? So it depends on the interlayer tunneling between the two graphene sheets. Now, I should mention that there was at the same, you know, actually a little bit earlier, very interesting um, experimental work by the group of Eva and Dre, where she saw, her group saw that at these points, there is a divergence of the density of states called a von Hoff singularity. And those von Hoff singularities went down to zero energy when the, the twist angle reached this value of 1.1. Okay, so there was already interesting single particle physics uh, experimental work and theoretical work you know, about a decade ago. Now, the, the, you know, these things that I wrote here, these are cartoons. This is an actual calculation of the electronic structure, <coughs> energy as a function of momentum from magic angle twisted by layer graphene. These are the set of flat bands. As you can see, they're not perfectly flat. There is a little bit of dispersion, but they are much, much flatter than the original graphene dispersion. The, in these flat bands, okay, what happens, you know, how do the electrons, where do the electrons like to be when you put them in these flat bands? Turns out that flat bands in momentum space, okay, if you want to look in real space, you have to do a Fourier transform, okay? Remember, the Fourier transform of a flat object is a highly picked object. So if you place electrons in these flat bands and you look at where do they like to go in the twisted by layer graphene system, it turns out they like to sit at places where locally, 
the two graphene sheets seem to be exactly on top of each other. We call that AA stacking, okay? Where all of the carbon atoms are in registry locally. Those regions of high electron density are tunnel coupled the regions of AB and BA stacking, regions where due to the small twist angle, now the carbon atoms go out of registry into this configuration, AB and BA. Yeah? So from the top, magic angle twisted by layer graphene schematically looks like this. There are these regions of AA stacking where the electrons like to sit, and they're separated by these regions of AB and BA stacking. In a slightly more realistic schematic, magic angle twisted by layer graphene consists of these you know, regions of AA stacking where the yellow circles are. There is where the electrons like to sit. Those regions are spaced by about 13 nanometers. This is what's going to be the equivalent of our you know, of a cold atoms, you know, triangular Fermi Hubbard lattice. Okay, although in reality, I put triangular in quotes because these regions A, B, and B, A are not identical. This is actually a honeycomb structure and it has interesting topological properties which makes it different from a standard Fermi color lattice. Now, what we saw, what my group saw in, back in 2018 is that if you put, you know, if you make a device at where the twist angle is this magic angle and you now put your Fermi energy in those flat bands, we see a variety of interesting correlated phenomena. In particular, we see that the conductance reaches zero. So you reach a special type of insulator state called a correlated insulator state when you feel a certain number of electrons or holes per molar unit cell. And moreover, when you dope away from those systems, uh, from those correlated insulator states, you have superconductivity. Your resistance experiences a big drop to zero below our noise measurement floor, okay? And the system is a superconductor. Now, this type of physics happens only in the vicinity when the twist angle is in the vicinity of this 1.1 degree, roughly 1.1 plus minus 0.1, maybe plus minus 0.15 degrees, okay? That's the margin, because only that flat band condition is rich for those twist angles, yeah? Now, magic angle twisted by graphene, part of the appeal, part of the interest is the fact that it is an electrically tunable superconductor, okay? So, if you measure the resistivity as a function of temperature and charge density, at this charge density where this red color is, we feel two holes per more unit cell in our system, right? and you have a correlated insulator state. If you add extra holes, you have a superconducting dome. If you add electrons, you have another superconducting dome. So when my students showed me this data, I was immediately fascinated because it reminded me of the hundreds of times that I have seen phase diagrams such as this. Okay? This is the phase diagram of the high temperature cuprate superconductors, temperature versus doping. Zero doping for the cuprates means one electron per unit cell. That's a mod insulator, a correlated insulator state. Now, let me flip this axis so that they correspond to whole doping electron tapping similar to here. If you add holes to a, you know, your mod insulator state, you have a big superconducting dome. If you add electrons, to your mode insulator state, you have a superconducting dome, okay? Here, in the case of graphene, two holes per more unit cell correspond to your correlated insulator. If you add extra holes, you have a big superconducting dome. If you add electrons, you have a small superconducting dome, okay? Now, of course, there are, you know, there are many differences between these two phase diagrams and these two families of materials. But one of the biggest differences between the phase diagrams is that this is a theoretical phase diagram, okay? In order to realize this to, you know, plot actual data points in this phase diagram, you need to grow hundreds and hundreds of crystals, each of them a different doping, each of you know, them you know, often involving different materials classes because you cannot realize all materials at all dopings, okay? Whereas in this case, this is all measured in a single device, in a single cool down with a single disorder realization and the density is controlled electronically without introducing chemical impurities. And I can go from one side to the other in a few seconds, okay? So that obviously is something which is an advantage to explore the phase diagram of these systems. And that has attracted a lot of attention. Now, we posted, you know, we, we announced our results at the APS March meeting in 2018, okay? The paper was published in April. And then after we posted this, then the theory tsunami came, you know? Uh, in case you haven't been paying attention to the archive, you know, th this, you know, well, this is actually a short list of the papers that appear within a few weeks of we posting our results. By now, this list has actually a few thousand papers, okay? 
Theories have been very interested in trying to understand what is the origin of the correlated insulated states and what is the superconducting order parameter. The first paper by Senke Shu and Leon Valens said this is a triangular lattice with a D plus ID chiral topological superconducting state. Subsequently, all types of states have been predicted with all letters of the alphabet, you know, S, P, D, F, S plus P plus D, P plus IP, you name it, okay? So much has been predicted. I'm not gonna comment about which is my favorite choice because, yeah, there's too much. Interestingly, some, some articles, you know, the second theory paper was by Gregory Volovic, where he told us actually that uh, finally we have, you know, measured everything that he predicted theoretically, and he told us how to get to room temperature. Okay, so I encourage you to read this article; it's quite nice, actually. And who knows? We'll see. You know, if we make it one day. Now, in addition to you know lots of theories uh, working on this, this attracted also some attention by by you know the popular press. So you know, I call this the rise of more quantum matter. You know, stories started to appear about you know what's what's you know what's the magic be behind my magic angle graphene, etc. You know, nothing else. These pictures are so cool. I wish I was able to design them myself. Now, what have been the experimental developments that have occurred since? Okay, since we actually published the paper in April 2018. Okay, so many things have happened. So the first one is that we have reproduced our own results. Believe it or not, that doesn't always happen when you're experimentally. So it's good when it happens. You know, you're able to reproduce yourself. By now, we have you know made many, many, many devices. In fact, we're starting to strike these type of diagrams where we can dope, where we can plot the critical temperature at optimal doping as a function of twist angle. So we have now a superconducting dome, but in twist angle. Okay, and you know, plenty of the people are doing similar things. Even better than you reproducing yourself is when other groups completely independently reproduce your results, okay? Only then it becomes true science, okay? True physics. So many, many groups have reproduced our results. The first two groups were, first a collaboration between the group of Corey Dean at Columbia University and the group of Andrea Young at UC Santa Barbara. Not only they reproduced our results, they were able to extend them upon pressure and tune the superconductivity with pressure in the system. Then the group of Dimitri Efetov in, at ICFO in Spain, was able to show in a device that you can get additional superconducting domes, making the phase diagram even richer. By now, robust superconductivity is a very well established phenomenon in magic and graphene. It has been reproduced by about a dozen groups all over the world. Now, we have discovered other correlated systems based on these Twistronics platforms. Okay, the first one was magic, I mean, the second one after the original one was magic angle twisted by layer by layer graphene. So this is now, you get two layers of graphene. We have the natural stacking in graphite, it's called Bernal stacking, so zero degrees. You have another two layers also with zero degrees between them, and now pairwise you twist them by a magic angle, okay? This system is not an insula is not a superconductor, but it exhibits interesting correlated insulator physics and interesting magnetic properties, okay? Since then, there have been many other systems that have been, you know, obviously strongly correlated systems that have been discovered. Now, people have started to do very interesting scanning probe microscopy studies, okay, of the system. So they were able to start to look microscopically as what's going on, you know, in these moray patterns, okay. In particular, you know, most of what we knew until recently uh, in terms of the phase diagram of, of magic and graphene was due to these global transform measurements that my group and other groups had done, okay. And roughly it goes like this. So in a temperature versus Filling factor, this filling factor is density, but it's useful to normalize it by the density that fits in a more unit cell, okay? But the number of electrons you can put in a more unit cell, which is a maximum of four electrons or four holes in those flat bands. Remember I told you four, number four would appear. This has to do with spin up, spin down, valet K, valet K prime, okay? So if we normalize, you know, our charge density by the number, you know, of electrons and holes per more unit cell, then you go from zero from charge neutrality, one, two, three, four holes per more unit cell, and then one, sorry, four electrons per more unit cell, and minus one, minus two, minus three mean one, two, three holes per more unit cell. Okay. So in total, from bottom to top, from bottom of the flat band to top of the flat band, you can put eight electrons per more unit cell. So now what we saw in transport is that interesting features. Okay, for example, correlated insulated states appear at two and three electrons per more unit cell, also at two holes, sometimes at three holes per more unit cell. 
Other interesting correlated states appear at other integer factors, okay? And superconductivity appears nearby, especially this one is the most pronounced in all studies, the superconducting dome. But this one is also quite frequently seen. Now, nobody knew exactly what was going on at these integers. And then we started to do thermodynamic measurements with using scanning from microscopy. And in particular, this study with my colleague, Shahalilani at the Weizmann Institute, and similar work was uh, done with uh, using a scanning tally microscopy by the group of Ali Yazdani, and we have done further work ourselves, has shown that if you measure the thermodynamic properties, in particular the chemical potential of the system, and you take the derivative, so what we take, you know, mu is the chemical potential, n is the charge density, this quantity d and d mu is called the compressibility of the system, but it's easier to think of the inverse compressibility, d mu dn, how does the chemical potential in your system change as you add charge to your system. Turns out with a scanning single electron transistor, which is a very sensitive voltmeter, okay, we could measure what was the evolution of the ground state thermodynamic properties of our system. And what we saw is that when you measure this inverse compressibility, d mu dn, as a function of this filling factor, and these different traces are for different twist angles, okay, what you can see is that near you know, this magic angle, Let's take this trace, for example, 1.13 degrees. Near each integer, you have this sawtooth type of behavior, okay? That sawtooth type of behavior is telling you that there is a cascade of phase transitions which is taking place in your system, yeah? This thing is a little bit um, subtle to explain. Let me just give a very simplistic picture. Basically, what happens is if we start from charge neutrality, okay, as we add charge to our system, all those four flavors, spin and valley, spin up, spin down, valley K, valley K prime, I told you earlier, start getting filled with charge. Okay? So this, this vertical axis here is telling you the occupation of those four flavors. And they all get filled at the same time. Now, when you have almost one electron per mole in itself in total, so near one quarter of these flavors, you know, each of these flavors filled, the system decides due to strong Coulomb interactions is spontaneously flavor polarized. All of the electrons get transferred to one of these flavors and the other three you know, flavors empty. And then you start again, okay? You keep adding charge to your system near total filling factor two. When I should have two electrons in total per more unit cell, it turns out you know, one of them is already filled, the other three, which have now about one third of an electron each, it turns out the system spontaneously flavor polarizes, fills one flavor, and it empties the other two. Yeah? And the thing gets repeated again and again. In a simple theoretical model, that gives you this sort of type of behavior in the inverse compressibility. And it's something for which you need a critical interaction strength in your system, okay? So I will briefly mention something about this, okay? We call this resets, okay? These phase transitions, we also call them resets. They will appear later again. Now, something very interesting that, ha that has happened too is that people have measured in these more quantum systems, in magic and graphene in particular, ferromagnetism, anomalous Hall physics, and even quantum anomalous Hall effect, okay? Which tells you that these systems have very interesting topology in, in addition to strong correlations in them. Okay. In fact, one of my you know, biggest joys is that this field of more quantum matter has meant the merging of several modern condensed matter communities. You know, people that did not talk too much you know, to each other now are talking a lot to each other. And in particular for me, you know, I'm learning a lot from interacting a lot with people that I had not discussed much physics with before. So on one hand, you have the two-dimensional Van der Waals materials and heterostructures community, people that work on graphene, like myself. On the other hand, you have strongly correlated materials community, people that work on nictites, cuprates, etc., And then the people that worked on topological condensed matter physics, quantum Hall and fractional quantum Hall effect, topological insulators, all three of these communities have come together in this field of more quantum matter. So now in this second half of my talk, let me tell you about this new, about this new system, you know, this next generation more quantum matter or more magic 3.0, okay? So just published this past, you know, about one month ago, okay? A bit over a month ago, we had, you know, my group to, you know, published in Nature the same week, the group of Philip King published in Science, 
the discovery of a new robust Moore superconductor, okay, is magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is a much richer system than the bilayer case, as I'm going to show you now. So, what's the structure that I'm talking about? This, you know, mirror symmetric magic angle twisted trilayer graphene. Now that's a mouthful, so let me show you the actual structure. It has three layers of graphene, okay? and there is symmetry between you know, from you know, bottom and top mirror symmetry with respect to the middle layer, okay? So that means that the bottom layer and the top layer of graphene are perfectly aligned, okay? Not rotating with respect to each other, zero degrees. And moreover, all of the carbon atoms are exactly aligned in the bottom and the top layer. The middle layer is twisted by an angle theta, okay? So if you go from bottom to top, you go bottom layer, you twist by minus theta, and then you twist again by theta so that bottom and top layers are exactly on top of each other. This type of stacking, this is a structure that was proposed by the group of Asbin Biswanath at Harvard University, and it's called A twisted A stacking, okay? This means all atoms are on top in the bottom and the top layers. Now, a lot more work has been done recently on this mirror symmetric magic angle twisted trilayer graphene and even more work on twisted trilayer graphene with varying angles and multi-layer systems with other numbers of layers, okay? This, this thing should have now at least two dozen references by now. Now, this structure is very interesting okay? because you can decompose this structure. You can think of these three layers, can okay? you get a three by three Hamiltonian where you can do a change of basis and it becomes a block diagonal Hamiltonian where one block is essentially magic angle twisted by layer graphene and the other block is regular monolayer graphene, okay? Now, interestingly, this magic angle by layer graphene has a square root of two extra, you know, term in the interlayer tunneling, okay? And that means the following. It means that the magic angle for magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is that for the bilayer case times square root of two. Because you remember, I told you earlier in the introduction that this interlayer tunneling is the one that determines what is the value of the magic angle. So the magic angle for magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is 1.56 degrees, okay? That means also that because the angle is a little bit larger, the Moray wavelength is shorter, okay? So the Moray wavelength in real space is about nine nanometers instead of the 13 nanometers. Now, this structure, again, the electronic structure in this mirror symmetric configuration is a combination of magic angle bilayer graphene and monolayer graphene. So this is an actual calculation of the electronic structure as a function of momentum. And you can see you get a, you know, these orange flat bands, which are very reminiscent of the magic angle twisted by layer graphene bands. And then you have on top this purple graphene massless Dirac dispersion. So you have this coexistence of these massless Dirac carriers and the flat band carriers, okay? Now that is in a mirror symmetric configuration. In our devices, we have the magic angle twisted trolley graphene, which is connected to source and drain electrodes. We have voltage probes to measure the electronic properties, but we have also a bottom gate and a bottom metallic electrode and a top metallic electrode, so that with these metallic electrodes, we can apply an electric field to change the charge density in our system. That's if we apply sort of the same polarity to both electrodes, but we can also apply opposite polarity and we can apply a transverse electric field perpendicular to the sample plane, okay? The transverse electric field breaks the mirror symmetry in the system, and then you can hybridize the massless direct bands and the flat bands, okay? So this is the electronic structure at zero displacement field. If we break the mirror symmetry, there is a hybridization between these bands, and this is a knob that we can control continuously, okay? This is the reason why the system is a lot richer than the magic angle bilayer case, because there we didn't have this extra knob. Now, let me show you first that the system is indeed a robust superconductor. So for a robust superconductor, you want to see zero resistance states. So when you measure the resistivity of the system as a function of temperature, you indeed have this drop to zero resistance, okay? You can fit this with a you know, Halperin Nelson formula and extract the Beresovsky Costa Lithaulis transition temperature, which is about 2.3 Kelvin for the system. 
50% normal state resistance is about three Kelvin. Now, this, you also want to see that indeed you can run a finite current through your device and you have zero voltage dissipation. So you want to see flat voltage current characteristics with a sharp switching. Okay, so there you go. Okay. You can now vary the temperature and you can see that these get modulated. You can do this type of analysis, which for those of you familiar, this is, you can extract the VKT temperature also this type of, using this type of analysis and it agrees perfectly well with this one. Now, this is an electrically tunable superconductor, similar to magic angle bilayographing. So the resistance versus temperature and filling factor density, this is the region around two holes per motor unit cell. You have supercatalytic domes for extra hole doping and for extra electron doping. You can do this also for around two electrons per motor unit cell, and you have the superconducting domes for extra electron doping and hole doping here. Okay, so in that sense, it's similar, you know, to magic angle bilayography. And now you want to also see what's the response to a magnetic field. So if you apply a perpendicular magnetic field to the device near optimal doping, you have that the superconductivity, the critical current, you know, superconductivity gets suppressed initially fast on a 100 millitesla scale and then slowly up to it survives up to about up to about half a tesla okay now if you change your density so that you go near the very edge of the superconducting dome when the system is barely superconducting the system due to disorder has these superconducting islands which are coupled and form a network of josephson junctions and that allows us to measure fraunhofer like interfering patterns that tells you that the system indeed exhibits just some phase coherence. Okay, so these all these three facts, you know, establish that this is a robust superconductor, and it's the second type in this family of Moray superconductors. Now, let me show you that the system is very highly tunable. Okay? So we have again these two knobs: the density and the electric displacement field. Okay, so let me show you. This is a, a measurement of the resistivity as a function of this filling factor or density. Again, from four holes per motor unit cell through charge neutrality to four electrons per motor unit cell and trans, you know, perpendicular displacement field applied on this axis, okay? So you can see that this is a complex phase diagram. Let me guide you a little bit through it. So first of all, these light blue regions, those are regions where superconductivity exists. The system is superconducting in that parameter space, okay? The yellow features are regions where the system is highly resistive, okay? Now, I'm going to focus on the superconductivity. First thing that I wanna show you here is that you can see that there is quite a degree of symmetry between top, the top half and the bottom half of this diagram, okay? So positive and negative displacement field has the similar effect, okay? The system is quite symmetric, top and bottom. Now, the system is also relatively symmetric, or if you want to focus on it, is asymmetric left and right of charge neutrality, okay? Left and right of zero, okay, there is some symmetry. Superconductivity occurs mostly between filling factors minus two, minus three, and two and three. And there is also these branches where superconductivity occurs between one and two and minus one, minus two, okay? But there are other features which are asymmetric. For example, this highly resistive feature near one electron per water unit cell is not present in the same degree near one hole per water unit cell. No, this type of asymmetry between electrons and holes from charge neutrality is also present in magic angle bilayography. In that sense, the system is quite reminiscent of the physics of magic angle bilayography. Now, because this is quite complex, let's measure at a different quantity, okay? Also versus these two knobs versus filling factor and displacement field. And let's see if, what else can we learn about this thing. So the quantity that we decided to measure is the whole density and I'm normalizing it, you know, I'm multiplying again by four and divided by the super lattice density so that it's equivalent to this filling factor that goes from four holes to four electrons, but now for whole density, okay? Now, this is the measurement of this normalized whole density as a function of filling factor and displacement field. Again, a relatively complex diagram. Let me guide you through it. To zero order, most of the features that appear in this diagram can be associated with one of these three situations, okay? The first one is a situation where your whole density 
goes from negative going smoothly through zero and goes to positive, changes sign. That's a behavior that you expect to see. Again, the whole density, you can think of it as you know, free carriers available in your system to conduct, okay? This is a situation that occurs at a gap or at a Dirac point, okay? For example, you can see that at charge neutrality, where the system has a Dirac point, you can see this behavior. You go from dark blue to light blue to white, then light red, then darker red, okay? That's the behavior that you see, for example, at charge neutrality in a few other places too. Now, other features in this diagram are associated with these resets of the whole density. The whole density is increasing, increasing, and then it drops abruptly close to zero, and then starts increasing again. That can happen with red color for electrons or with blue color for holes. Let me show you here an example of a reset for holes. You have here, you go from light blue to darker blue, darker blue, then it goes abruptly to white, to zero, and then starts increasing again the color, lighter blue, darker blue, okay? And that happens in a number of other places. These resets exemplify the cascade, you know, they, they tell you about that cascade of phase transitions, those resets that I told you earlier in magic angle by layer graphene, okay? And then the last feature I want you to focus on are this von Hoff singularity type of features. Here, at a von Hoff singularity, which is a divergence of your density of states, your whole voltage goes smooth, smoothly through zero. Your whole density, which is one over your whole voltage, therefore diverges, okay? So it diverges, flips sign, and then continues evolving, okay? So this von Hoff singularity type of behavior can be seen, for example, here. You can see that the color here goes from light blue to dark blue, then it switches abruptly to dark red, and then it goes to light red, okay? So light blue, dark blue, switches abruptly to dark red, and then light red. And you have that behavior here, you have that behavior here, you have that behavior in some of the places in this diagram, okay? So now we can look at these two diagrams and try to see if we find you know, any matching between the features in these diagrams, okay? So I'm going to focus on the superconducting regions boundaries, okay? And now because superimposing these two diagrams would be a little bit messy, let me just focus on the schematics. So this is a plot of the superconducting regions as a function of filling factor and displacement field, okay? Dark blue means strong, very robust superconductivity, light blue means weak, you know, still present, but weak superconductivity. Now, I'm going to draw lines here with the different boundaries in the normalized whole density plot. Yeah? So these schematic lines are regions where we saw gap Dirac type of behavior, for example, a charge neutrality. These orange lines represent those resets in the normalized whole density. Yeah? And the dark blue lines correspond to regions where we have Van Hoff singularities in our system. And now a picture emerges where it's clear that the superconductivity is at low displacement field bounded by resets of the whole density. And at high displacement field is bounded by Van Hoff singularities and also sometimes gap Dirac regions, okay? So let's look a little bit more closely at that. So let's explore in particular, let's take a cut at that Van Hoff singularity in that from Hobbes singular along the density uh, along the filling factor at you know, near that from Hobbes singularity. If I measure the resistivity, okay, so that's a cut taken here. I have zero resistance in the superconducting state and near filling factor minus three, the system stops being superconducting. That's exactly what happens there, okay? If I measure the critical temperature, the critical temperature is high in the middle of the superconducting region, and then it decreases and it ends, of course, the moment our system stops being superconducting, okay? Now, I can measure the effective mass of the carriers in my system. The effective mass is proportional to the density of states. So I can measure that effective mass of those carriers along this trace, okay? That's plotted here, the effective mass. So think of this as density of states. As you can see, the density of states increases as I reach that point and then decreases. So it diverges at this point. This point corresponds to that von Hoff singularity where indeed you expect a divergence of your density of states. Now the interesting and key, you know, one of the key messages of my talk is that you can see that superconductivity ends 
add that from Hopf singularity. Yeah? In usual BCS type superconductors, recoupling BCS type superconductors, your critical temperature increases exponentially as the density of states increases. Okay? Here it's the opposite. TC not only doesn't increase, it actually decreases as the density of state increases and it ends, okay, it's zero at the maximum in, the, in your density of states. Okay? So that's very much unlike what typical standard superconductors do. Okay? Now, let me tell you uh, a bit more. Okay? So this is not weak coupling, okay? it's actually ultra strong coupling. So let's do the following. We can measure this critical temperature, the BKT critical temperature versus filling factor and displacement field. Okay. So we can do this again. This is the most tunable superconductor that exists. Okay. So we have so many knobs. We can measure this as a function of those two parameters. Let me project this into a top plane so that it's easier to see. You can see superconductivity is strongest here. It's also present here. It's very weak in some of these regions. Now, because these color plots are a little bit hard to decipher sometimes. Let me show you a cut of the BKT temperature as a function of filling factor at optimal electric field, optimal displacement field, and separately at optimal charge density as a function of displacement field, okay? So this is the first cut, TBKT in dark blue as a function of filling factor at optimal displacement field. You can see there is a very small superconducting dome for electrons. This is the region around two holes per mole unit cell. And with, if we add more holes, we have a big superconducting dome. In that sense, it's similar to magic angle by graphene. This is the strongest dome. Now, I can at the same time measure the super, the Ginzburg-Landau superconducting coherence length. That's given by this pink in the points, okay? This, La coherence length is actually extremely short. How short? In order to do that, let me compare it with the interparticle distance in the superconductor. This is the average interparticle distance as a function of density, okay? As you can see near optimal doping, your superconducting coherence length is of the same order as your interparticle distance, okay? Now, I have to remind you that these are the, these Moiré superconductors are the lowest charge density superconductors that exist in the world by over an order of magnitude compared to the next one, okay? So these are extremely dilute superconductors. And the fact that your superconducting coherence length is of the same order as the average in the particle distance tells you that your Cooper pairs have a size which is roughly the same as your average in the particle distance, okay? <coughs> we can study this also as a function of displacement field at optimal density, okay, at this optimal density. I can study also the superconducting coherence length. This is the average interparticle distance at optimal density. Okay? So in the weak coupling regime, the superconducting coherence length gives you the Cooper pair size. In the strong coupling regime, this is just a bound. But as you can see, at optimal doping, the Cooper pair size is at least you know, of average the interparticle distance, yeah? of the same order as the average interparticle distance. Now, this immediately reminds one of this type of diagrams that are typically plot in, in the cold atoms communities, okay? In cold atom systems, they can tune the interaction strength between cold atoms such that they can go all the way from the BCS limit where your Cooper pairs are much bigger than your average in the particle distance all the way to the extreme BEC limit where your Cooper pairs are tightly bound and have much smaller size than the average in the particle distance, okay? And when these two things are, you know, these two length scales are roughly the same, Cooper pair and in the particle distance, that occurs at the so-called BCS to BEC crossover. Okay? Now, it turns out that your critical temperature, okay, in three dimensions, your, the ratio of your critical temperature to your Fermi temperature, which tells you essentially the density of electrons that you have, is bounded, okay, it has an up and bound of 0.22. In two dimensions, you have to speak about a berezovsky kosterly thaulis transition, and your TVKT over TF is theoretically predicted to be bounded by 0.125. That bound is reached at the BCS to BC crossover, okay? It's predicted recently. Now, we can actually measure the Fermi temperature of our system because we have the effective mass and we have the density, and we also have 
TBKT. Okay? This is a measurement of the effective mass versus filling frac, you know, versus charge density or filling factor at optimal electric field. We can therefore calculate the ratio of TBKT over TF, and you have it like this. We can do this also as a function of displacement field at optimal density, and it looks like this. And here is 0.125. Okay. This system, in this system, magic angle trilayographing, TVKT over TF reaches values in excess of 0.1. The maximum, the maximum happens to be actually at about 0.125. Now, I don't want to make too big a deal out of that because those calculations that I showed before are for cold atom systems where the mass of the boson is equal to twice the mass of the fermionic atoms, you know, that both condense. For electrons, that is not necessarily the case. Okay, but still, the fact that it reaches these very high values, this is the highest of any superconductor that exists at all in any system. Okay, so in fact, one typically shows that type of you know how strongly coupled the superconductor is by showing what's you know in a diagram in a plot in log log scale of the critical temperature versus the Fermi temperature, which is the density normalized by some factors. Okay. And in this type of diagram, okay, let me show here the BC to BCS crossover line in three dimensions. This type of diagrams, conventional superconductors, weak coupled superconductors tend to be around this region. Okay? For example, aluminum has a TC of one Kelvin, but it has a Fermi temperature of 100, over 100,000 Kelvin. So aluminum has a gigantic density of electrons, and given how large that density of electrons is, it superconducts relatively modestly. Okay, now the more you go diagonally towards this other corner, in particular towards this purple band, the more and more exotic your superconductor tends to be. Okay, in particular in this purple band, you have all of the unconventional superconductors pretty much. You have the cuprates, the nictites, you have the heavy fermions here, the organics. I've even plot some, uh, sorry, let me show uh, no, the cold atoms data, sorry, are not here. This is the T BKT equal um, BC, the BC, BCS crossover line in two dimensions. Now, if you look at magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, depending on whether you use the BKT temperature or the 50% normal state resistance, your data points in this diagram are here. If you plot magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, those two points are here. Okay. As I showed you, for the TBKT, you reach exactly that theoretical limit. This is the strongest superconductor, the strongest coupled superconductor that exists, okay? If the cuprates had a coupling strength of magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, they will be well above room temperature superconductors, well above, okay? Now I have to mention that a, C, a, a recent work by Iwasa's group and a different superconductor has also been able to realize that limit of TBKT over TF of 0.25, 0.125. Okay, now let me tell you in the last uh, few minutes, my talk about this unexpected surprise that happened when we started to do magnetic field measurements in our system with the magnetic field applied in plane. So first, let me remind you, you know, if we apply a perpendicular magnetic field to this, to the superconductor, you induce vortices and superconductivity disappears. That happens well below one Tesla perpendicular field, okay? Now, because this is a two-dimensional superconductor, if you apply an in-plane magnetic field, you don't have that type of you know, vortex formation, you know, that type of orbital physics. Okay? So in principle, a two-dimensional superconductor allows us to see what happens when you apply a purely Zeeman field to your superconductivity. Okay? Now, what is the usual effect of a Zeeman field on conventional superconductors? Okay? So conventional superconductors have a spin singlet Cooper pairs, okay? entangled state of the electron spins in your Cooper pair. Now, the binding energy, the gap within BCS theory is proportional you know, to the critical temperatures. It's 1.76 kVTC. Now, those Cooper pairs in a Zeeman field, they break apart, okay? The Zeeman effect splits the Cooper pairs apart, you know, when the Zeeman splitting, which is given by Jimmy UVB, is of the same order as your gap, okay? That thing is known as the Pauli limit or the paramagnetic limit or the Ch Chandrasekhar Clarkson limit. Okay. And if you put numbers, okay, here, you get that the Pauli limit 
is 1.86 times your critical temperature in Tesla over Kelvin, okay? So for a TC of one Kelvin, you expect your superconductivity to completely disappear at about 1.86 Tesla. Now, this is for VCS spin singlet superconductors. So let me show you our data. So we warm up our sample, we rotate it so that we have like a parallel magnetic field, and then we cool down again. We measure at zero magnetic field. This diagram is very similar to the one that I showed you before. Okay. Now, at optimal doping, uh, our critical temperature is about 2.7 Kelvin. This means that by the time you apply five Tesla, the superconductivity should be long gone. Okay. Now, these are the data at 10 Tesla in plane parallel magnetic field. This blue region is region of robust superconductivity and it's still very much present at optimal doping for a broad range of displacement fields, okay? Now, we can do this type of measurements. Uh, first of all, let me show you the actual critical current curves, okay? You can see from zero Tesla, as we increase the parallel field, the critical current decreases, but you know, these are the zooming into the data for eight, nine, and 10 Tesla. You can see it's still perfectly superconducting, even at 10 Tesla and in excess of it. Now, we can do this type of measurements, resistivity versus filling factor and displacement field at different parallel magnetic fields, okay? You can see that the superconducting region shrinks, but still present at 10 Tesla, okay? Now, in order to check you know, how much are we violating this Pauli limit that I mentioned earlier? We have to do temperature dependence measurements. So again, I'm gonna show lots of cuts because these are data, two dimensional plots, 3D plots on, which are cuts of five dimensional parameter space, you know, plots, okay? Yeah? So we have the resistivity versus filling factor and temperature. This is the usual superconducting tone, you know, in, versus doping. Now we can take those data at different parallel magnetic fields. You can see that at 10 Tesla, there's still a superconducting dome. Okay. So if I take now a cut where I measure the resistivity versus temperature and versus parallel field continuously at a particular density, filling factor, in this case, minus 2.28, minus you can see these, are, these lines are equal resistance contours, okay? You can take different thresholds for your superconducting temperature, you know, 10%, 20%, 30%. The same thing happens for 50% or for TVKT, same type of contours, okay? Now, these contours roughly follow the gizmur landau expression. They're proportional to B squared, as you can see here, they're parabolas. And that means if you calculate what the power limit should be for critical temperature, taking any threshold that you want, this should be the Pauli limits, okay? Corresponding to the different thresholds. As you can see, our system is superconducting up to much, much, much higher values, okay? In fact, in particular, the Pauli violation ratio at this density is greater than three, okay? Now, what, how could, you know, what could this be due to, okay? So there are different mechanisms that can give you this Pauli violation limit in superconductors. For example, strong spin orbit coupling. You know, niobium selenide, which can be uh, made a monolayer superconductor, has a very strong spin orbit coupling, and that leads to large polyviolation. However, graphene has extremely weak spin orbit coupling, and it would have to be, you know, nearly two orders of magnitude larger in our trilayer graphene structures for it to start to take a dent, you know, to make an impact in the type of polyviolation ratios that we see. Another possibility is to have these finite momentum pairing states, they're called FFLO states, where you have finite momentum pairing, and that gives you a boost of your uh, critical field of about 20 to 40% at low temperatures. However, we see you know, factors of three, so 300%, and already starting right away from TC, not only at low temperatures. So this, again, is very unlikely to be able to explain this. Another possibility is that we have preformed pairs, you know, some sort of pseudo gap perhaps, okay? Because we're in the strong coupling regime, as I mentioned earlier, that could be a possibility. However, remember that we can tune the coupling strength by density, and we can tune the coupling strength by over an order of magnitude. However, our pilot violation ratios are above two, you know, two and a half to three over the entire density range, over the entire superconducting dome, 
you know, where the coupling strength varies by over an order of magnitude. Okay, so again, this is very unlikely to explain it. Okay, moreover, none of these three mechanisms can give you what I'm going to show you next. Okay, which is reentrant superconductivity at very high magnetic field. The data that I showed you before for the Pauli violation ratio were at this optimal electric field and optimal density. If I look at less than optimal displacement field here in the middle, okay, we see this. We see that if we measure the resistivity versus parallel magnetic field, this is only the high field region. Your critical temperature goes down, goes down, goes down, goes to zero, and then surprise, the system becomes superconducting again at higher magnetic field, okay? We can, you know, we, we level these phases superconducting one and superconducting two. You can see this not only in your critical temperature, but you can also see it in your critical current. Your critical current decreases, 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 to becomes almost zero, and then starts growing again, okay? Now, how, you know, how can this happen, okay? Well, there are a few examples of other systems where reentrant superconductivity appears above a Pauli limit, okay? The system said to be very exotic, in particular, the uranium family of superconductors, uranium platinum three, and this family, uranium germanium, germanium two, germanium, uranium, rhodium germanium, cobalt germanium, and more recently, uranium tellurium two, okay? These systems, these three systems above are ferromagnetic superconductors. This one is a spring triplet, nearly ferromagnetic superconductor. Okay, it was recently discovered, and this is one of the few systems where they have these reentrant superconducting phases above a Pauli limit. Okay, now in our case, you know, so this system realizes a field induced superconducting phase. In our case, again, because we can tune all our parameters continuously, we can also see that we have two superconducting phases one and two. The magnetic field induces the transition between these two, they're separated. Okay, we can show this as a function of displacement field and as a function of thinning factor. Okay? This data in combination with the Pauli violation data very strongly indicates that our system cannot be a spin singlet superconductor and it's most likely a spin triplet superconductor. So with this, I wanna take just a minute to tell you about Outlook. You know, you can see that, you know, quite a bit of magic is realized in this more quantum matter, all kinds of correlated insulators, superconductivity, magnetism, even more for electricity, this recently has been demonstrated. All phases of condensed matter pretty much were slowly discovering them or rediscovering them in the systems. This is using relatively simple systems, you know, graphene and transition metal dicalcogenides. We have infinite more possibilities as we start to use two-dimensional systems, which are themselves very complex, like cuprate, superconductors, ferroelectrics, quantum spin liquids. What happens if we now twist them and put them on top of each other and make more systems, okay? Two examples that have been theoretically predicted recently are high temperature topological superconductivity when you twist double, co double layer copper oxides, okay? So you take a cuprate to twist it with itself and you can make special type of topological superconductivity. If you take a two-dimensional crystalline magnet and you twist it on itself, you can realize more a magnets with special type of skirmionic spin textures. The possibilities are endless, okay? And not only that, this whole field goes beyond pistronics in condensed matter physics, okay? So people are starting to do more and twisted cold atom lattices. And they're predicting all kinds of interesting effects. People are doing this thing with classical mechanical systems. They call more and twisted phononics, okay? You can do this also with photonics, more and twisted photonic systems, okay? These effects can be, you know, the uh, equations are very similar at the single particle level for all of these systems, and they are very interesting. So with this, I wanna end by thanking my group members. This is actually the work of Juan Sao and Jane Park, together with Daniel Rodan. I hope we can soon go back to these type of events in person, and I hope you will invite me again so that I can visit RISE in person, plenty of other collaborators, funding agencies, and I want to thank you all for your attention. All right, I will, I will clap on behalf of everyone. Thank you, Pablo, for a, for a spectacular